Thank you so much for that kind and warm invitation. I'm thrilled to be here. And thanks to Phoebe Institute on Aging for having me here today to um, talk about why dance is for everyone else. Actually, dance is for you, not just for the other people. Um, I thought I would start, I don't usually start with a film, but I thought I would start uh, to give you a sense of what our program is, because I think it's very hard sometimes to imagine how folks with Parkinson's might uh, be in a dance class and might be impacted by that experience. I know when we started the program in 2001, a lot of the response was, huh? So um, I thought we'd watch a, a brief overview of the program uh, from the PBS NewsHour, and then I'll come back and tell you all about it. Next, a unique program that brings together dancers and people living with Parkinson's disease. Special correspondent David Iverson tells the story. The Mark Morris Dance Center occupies a busy corner of Brooklyn. It's home to one of the best known modern dance companies in the world, where the physical defines the art. But it's also home to a different group of dancers, where the physical defines a disease. Parkinson's. Our society tells us again and again that there are people who can dance and there's everybody else who shouldn't even bother. And I think that's such a tragedy. David Leventhal and John Higginbotham have performed lead roles in some of the Mark Morris Dance Company's signature works. But they also teach some of those same moves to people with Parkinson's, creating both a unique class and a special community. Mary Good was diagnosed with Parkinson's two years ago. The world judges us by how we look. And, you know, Parkinson's, people with Parkinson's have really um, a look that people shy away from. Is the class then a place where you're not judged? That's exactly right. Exactly right. It's one of those situations where everybody's in the same boat. Class member Joy Esterberg has had Parkinson's for seven years, but this class has given her something new. It's given me a, a community that you don't have that in New York for the most part. This community is like being in a small town. And contracting everything. My impression is that many people with Parkinson's feel like they're outside of the human experience and Dance is a huge part of the human experience, and so to come in and dance, you're human again. I want to welcome anybody who's new. At a meeting before the class begins, the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's are often apparent. A hand that shakes, muscles that stiffen. Opening to the sides. But when class starts, symptoms often seem to slip away. Take a big dive forward and arc with your hands. Class member Reggie Butts. When the dance class is going on, there are no patients, the dancers. It's a phenomenon that neurologist Dr. Claire Hinchcliffe like finds striking. It's fascinating to see people who may have walked in slowly and sat down slowly and stood up slowly. And then when the music comes on, they really just get going. Stop, stop, stop. Hey! But it's not just the music and motion that's helpful. Hey. With Parkinson's, everyday actions like stepping and reaching take greater focus and concentration, which is exactly what dance demands. Feel the volume of the hat as you go forward and weight of it. You have to learn complex series of steps, for example. I'm starting out with my palms facing me, and I'm going to rotate my hand so my palm is now facing down. There are pauses, there are turns, there are points where you go backwards, there are points where you mirror what your partner is doing. It has the, the physical component, but I think it also has the cognitive component. In dance class, the mind and the body are constantly working together. You know, dancing is the ultimate mind-body connection. And, and open. And dance requires mind and imagination, focus and physicality. So does living with Parkinson's. It's grace that's hard won. To be in control of 
your own movement and making it pleasing to yourself is a, a wonderful thing. Toss the flower petals. It's liberated a part of me, uh, created a, a, a sense of, of freedom, a sense of creativity. And swing. Perhaps that's why this isn't a class people skip. Reggie Butts is here just out of the hospital. His wife Bobby never misses either. The movement of butterflies and birds and throwing flowers. Pedal toss. With dance, you soar. As they leave your fingers. It's really like, like bliss in a way um, because there's no constraint. If it's physical and you extend your arm, you have an, you have an ideal uh, sense of what an ascended arm looks like. It doesn't look like this. But if you try to do it and in your mind's eye you're feeling it and doing it utterly to the extent that you can imagine it, then you're there. And when you're there, Parkinson's isn't, at least not in the same way. Which is why Dance for Parkinson's, as it's officially known, is now stretching beyond its Brooklyn borders. The best thing to, to plan around would be our regular Dance for PD class. Which and David Leventhal, who this year won a New York Dance and Performance Award honoring his storied dance career, is leaving his performance life behind to devote all his time to Dance for Parkinson's. Now I spend a lot of the week on conference calls, <laughs> which is something I never imagined. We have classes right now in about 14 states, uh, from California to Washington State to Texas, Houston, Texas, uh, all the way down to Florida. There are three classes down there. And this class has given me a completely new and welcome understanding that movement is everybody's right that we're all entitled to move, we're all entitled to dance in the most natural, free, joyous way. And Joy, it's not a quality you associate often with Parkinson's. And yet, it is what you see here. There are people in this class whose condition limits how they move, but not their smile or spirit. We, we don't as yet know how to measure that objectively. And uh, someone's sense of happiness and that, how that affects their Parkinson's disease. We don't know how to measure joy or happiness, but we should try. And if you could measure joy in this corner of Brooklyn, you would also find that what you give, you receive, and that every bit of it is shared. One of the reasons I'm so excited to be here today is that many people see Parkinson's as a window into the aging process. Many of the challenges that people with Parkinson's face are things that people naturally face as part of the aging process. It's just that with Parkinson's, that process is often compressed into a much shorter time. And sometimes that process happens much earlier in uh, somebody's life than, than they were expecting, than their life plan thought it would, it would be. So um, uh, many people in our class are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, we have a 94 year old. But some people in the class are also in their 40s and 50s. And one of the challenges with that is that people um, are often struck with Parkinson's at the very uh, height of their careers, as Dr. Will, fabulous presentation, by the way, um, was, was highlighting, you know, we really reach a, a, a point of what dancers or athletes would call flow in our 40s and 50s. And so to be contending with Parkinson's at that, at that age can be quite difficult. Here are two people who had to contend with Parkinson's quite early on in their lives. Michael J. Fox was uh, diagnosed at age 31. Um, so one of the challenges with, particularly with a chronic disease like Parkinson's, is that people often find their whole identities start to shift into a medicalized model. So they feel surrounded by their symptoms, entrapped within their symptoms. And everything related to their life changes. So as their lives used to be prescribed by work responsibilities, by family, um, by recreation, 
suddenly there's symptoms like slowness of movement, bradykinesia, um, possibility of freezing, not being able to move at all, uh, rigidity, postural instability, depression, tremor, the list goes on. I don't want to focus too much on symptoms, but so these things are things that you uh, often encounter every day, and they start to impinge on what you've established to be your, your life, your lifestyle. Um, and it's difficult to avoid them. People with Parkinson's often talk about the fact that this is a condition that they wear. It's not something you can hide. Um, and so the rest of the world, as Mary Good said in the, in the video, the rest of the world starts to judge you and starts to, starts to move away from you. And so your social connections start to be uh, more challenging. You become more isolated. It's harder to go out. Um, your life, if you're not careful, often becomes caught up in a web of prescriptions, doctor's visits, and isolation. And because Parkinson's is something that people live with for many, many years, we have people in our group who have Parkinson's for almost 30 years, there's a great danger, I think, in seeing or in embracing this sort of permanent medicalization, where I am, I am a patient and I have to live with this, I have to attend to this for the rest of my life. So we need a way of thinking about our lives that brings back a sense of dignity, a sense of humanity, uh, a sense of possibility. Now, uh, we work very closely with a number of neurologists, uh, and they support what we do now, because maybe 15 years ago. But one of the challenges that people with Parkinson's face is that when they go into that doctor's office and somebody says to them, I have to tell you that I think you have Parkinson's disease, they're often no, there, there isn't a focus on three critical areas. Uh, unfortunately, there's often a focus on prescriptions, sometimes on physical therapy, but a few things that are not often addressed. One, and this is changing, the value of physical activity. We're starting to see a dramatic shift in how neurologists and other movement disorder specialists address the issue of moving and physical activity is now uh, often seen on an equal level, on an equal level to, to prescriptions, but that's only the last few years. Um, as recently as 20 years ago, physical activity was counterindicated for Parkinson's because neurologists and other specialists thought it was too dangerous for folks with PD to get out there and exercise or take a dance class. Fortunately, thanks to a lot of really good research, um, primarily in exercise, that is starting to change. But among a, an older generation of neurologists, it's so prevalent to, say, to look at only the, the um, uh, medication. And, uh, medication schedule and potentially surgery down the road. Number two, people with Parkinson's are very rarely told the diagnosis how to move. What are some strategies they can use for thinking about movement as those automatic movements, which are particularly affected in Parkinson's, become, become more impaired? What are some strategies we can use? And third, a focus on the whole person. So one of us, see Dr. Hill, focusing on how we can engage in arts activities to fulfill all of our human needs, not just the need for basic uh, survival. And so focusing on the quality of life is critical for people with Parkinson's because it's not just a movement disorder, it ends up being a quality of life disorder. It affects all aspects of somebody's life. So where do dancers come into this? Well, as it turns out, dancers spend their lives thinking about and training to do all different kinds of movement with many different uh, conceptions. So when you start to look at this chart, if you're a neurologist, you start to see, or some of the Parkinson's, you start to see uh, a direct corollary, direct relationship between all of these things that dancers work on and all the things that start to go away. Dave Iverson, who produced that wonderful uh, PBS segment that you saw, talks about Parkinson's as a disease of subtraction that over time, things are taken away. And we have seen over the last 15 years of this program that dance gives a lot back. And it's in large part because of these elements. Folks with Parkinson's have difficulty initiating intentional movement. Dancers spend their whole lives working on strategies to do that. Um, balance is a huge factor with Parkinson's. People often lose an internal sense of balance as well as losing things like quick reflex or proprioception. Um, dancers, in whatever technique, whether it's ballet or jazz or Argentine tango, particularly Argentine tango, have to know exactly where the body is 
on its center of on that center of weight at any one time. We, that's that's a lot. Half of what we work on is being able to stand up. So when we get on stage, we're not constantly falling over. And so those strategies are particularly useful for, for people with Parkinson's. I could probably spend about two hours on this slide, but I'm not going to. I'm going to skip to the um, the one in green there, meaningful. In dance, we work very much on using the imagination in the service of movement. So movements are not random or arbitrary. They're connected to a story. They're connected to an emotion. They're connected to a why and a how, not just a what. And somehow, people with Parkinson's think about the how and the why. They're able to move much better than when they think about the what, the mechanics. So the idea behind the Dance Repeating Program is really to take the expertise that dancers have and to share it with people with Parkinson's, and it's that simple. The idea is that, contrary to the standard treatment as usual for Parkinson's, which is, which is L-Dopa or Cinemat, and a, a cocktail of other drugs, that we're actually teaching people skills and engaging their imaginative and creative sides. So traditionally, uh, dance has not been part of the equation. There have been a number of uh, what we think of as complementary activities for folks with Parkinson's to do, most of them centered around some kind of physical fitness and exercise, particularly in the last 10 years. And you may be surprised to see boxing there, but yes, there's a very popular program called Rock Steady Boxing, which engages boxing practice, not actual sparring, but practice to help people with their balance and coordination. It's a fabulous program. But dance has been notably absent. And when we look at the things that exercise addresses, we see some really important components here. Strength, stamina, flexibility, and balance. And when we look at the research that's been done, particularly on people with Parkinson's, we see that a regular program of what's called forced or intensive exercise. This is doing a, um, a tandem bike, which is biking with somebody else in front of you so that you can model and mirror your own rhythms. A tandem bike three times a week at, uh, for 45 minutes at 90 RPM. That's a fairly considerably high rate, uh, particularly for people who may be in their 70s and 80s and haven't really exercised before. However, if they do that rate, they will see improvements in gait, tremor, uh, balance, and some of the other symptoms that are related to Parkinson's, slowness of movement, for example. Um, and it's, it's great to see that. It's great to see a number of different exercise modalities coming in and starting to play a role in helping people manage their condition as well as uh, medication does. And again, this is a huge step forward from 20 years ago when none of these activities were recommended. So, but dance, dance occupies a, a, a unique place because here I, I picture it as Luxembourg, a little country that's bordered on all sides by other bigger countries. Um, or more well-known countries. And the reason we see it this way is that dance really does touch up against many other movement forms. There are elements of dance that are based on yoga. There are elements of dance that seem like running around, that, that, are, are, that are aerobic activity. There are elements of dance that are, that are integrating balance and control the way that Tai Chi does. But dance also has some very specific elements that relate to arts practice which is why it ties in today, and that's what I want to drill down a little bit more into so that we kind of understand not only why dance is valuable, but why the arts in general are valuable. Because I think everything that I'm going to say about dance could be applied to music, visual art, sculpture, um, singing, etc. And it all starts with a pirouette. A pirouette is very hard to show and still, but that's a pirouette. Uh, so, this gentleman here on the, on the left is Hermann von Helmholtz, a German physicist and physician in the days when you could do both. Um, I guess you still could if you went to school for a really, really long time. Anyway, he works a lot on optical perception, how we view the world and how our brain takes that information in and makes sense of it. And von Helmholtz thought a lot about the idea of how we edit out information. So when I'm looking at one point in the room and I change my focus quickly to another point, you don't really see what's in between. It's a blur, or I'm not aware of it at all. And in fact, if I were to take the time to try to see everything in between, it would take me a long time and it would be overwhelming. It's a lot of information. Some people get dizzy doing that. So, um, Oli Westheimer, who's the founder and executive director of the Brooklyn Parkinson Group, 
was talking to her husband, who's a neurologist and movement disorder specialist, Yvonne Bodish Wilma, at Downstate Medical College in, in Brooklyn. And he was talking about von Helmholtz and this, this idea of perception, and only said, that's so interesting because that's exactly what dancers do when they spot. As you notice, when I started to turn, I didn't let my head move with my body. I actually kept my head where it was until the last minute. And then when I couldn't go any further, I snapped it around and looked straight back again. In fact, most theaters, if you notice, have a red light in the back when they have dance shows. That's so the dancers on stage can spot their turns. They don't get dizzy. So she started thinking about this idea of the connection between what we know about how the brain works, sort of neuroscience part of things, and the strategies that dancers integrate into their training. And this led her to think about a dance program for people with Parkinson's. But she had two things here that she was really looking at. One is, of course, strategies, the ability that dancers have to train their bodies to do very, very complicated things. But the second, the second edge of this double-edged sword is that dance has nothing to do with Parkinson's. And at a dance class, it would be a way for members of a group who spent lots of time thinking about and worrying about and being anxious about Parkinson's to do something else for an hour or an hour and a half a week and to step away from their symptoms and to step away from the clinical setting and be human again or feel human again. So with these two ideas, she approached us in 2001 and said, would you be interested in offering a dance class for people with Parkinson's? And at the time, we had no background or knowledge of Parkinson's specifically. We knew what it was, sort of, but we had no experience working with folks with PD. Um, but we had just opened this new building in Brooklyn. We wanted our doors to be open to the community. And we had a particular aesthetic in our company. Mark Morris, who's pictured here down left as a younger man, he's, uh, it's about 30 years ago, I think, that photo, um, came from a folk dance background. And although his choreography was based on contemporary and ballet, there's also a strong folk element. In the folk uh, style, people of all ages and abilities dance together. There's very little hierarchy in that. Yeah, some people do solos, some people don't, but the overall aesthetic is one of a group dancing together. And that aesthetic informs not only the performing branch of the company, the Mark Barnes Dance Group, but all of the activities that take place in the Mark Barnes Dance Center, including the Dance for Parkinson's program. Um, Mark's idea is that, you know what, dance isn't everyone's cup of tea, but everyone should have a chance to access it and to enjoy it. And so Amy came to us because she knew this philosophy. She knew that we had this, this belief in the power of dance to transform people's lives and at least play a role in their lives. And so she wanted the program to be taught by professional dancers, not by trained therapists, not by dance movement therapists, not by movement coaches, but by dancers, because she wanted the program to be as close to a dance class that would be offered for anyone else as possible. And so the three of us, Missy Owens, John Higginbotham, who's on the film, and me, started teaching without a lot of knowledge of, Park of Parkinson's, we knew a little bit. And, and only really wanted to keep it that way. There was a little bit of a of a um, media blackout for a while that she encouraged us not to read up a lot on Parkinson's, but really just to teach what we knew, because she knew that all the things that dancers worked on would be useful for folks in the group. So this program, Dance for Pee, was born and still survives as a collaboration. A lot of information going back and forth between the two groups. So I wanted to draw <laughs> I always like starting with that one. <laughs> I wanted to drill down a little bit into what it is that dancers know. I think a lot of people, particularly in the medical field, don't really know what dancers do and don't really know their training. You think about the training, for those of you who practiced music, it's a very similar training of sort of neuromuscular conditioning, like patterning, where you practice the same thing again and again um, to get good at it, and along the way require the imagination and the story and sense of emotional uh, narrative to make sense of it all. So it's not just rote action, it's actually action that is um, initiated by the imagination. So yes, dance does, <laughs> dance is very difficult. Um, it gets at all of the elements of, of uh, neuroplasticity in terms of being complex and 
difficult um, and intense and challenging, but it's, uh, it, it is in itself a wonderful athletic activity. Um, and so when people say, well, is dance good exercise? I mean, yes, it is, but there's, there's more. There's more that happens in dance that doesn't happen in other forms. Um, one is the intense mastery of specific and new motor skills. So in dance, you're constantly learning not only new patterns, but new vocabulary, things that your body has never done before. Many people coming into our class have never done a tongue before, tongue which is stretching the foot forward. This is Mr. Balanchine practicing uh, or teaching tondus to his, uh, his group of dancers there. Um, and John and Jean both run their tondus there in the chairs. Um, so it's the, the ability for people to learn, as Dr. Ray said so articulately, to learn new skills and to repeat them, to master them, that happens in a dance setting that often doesn't happen elsewhere. When you think about traditional exercise interventions, it may be challenging and difficult, but it's not particularly complex. When you're running, it's the same action repeated over time. When you're dancing, you're doing a whole sequence of different moves with different qualities uh, over duration. Dancers spend many of their, uh, their working hours thinking about how to put meaning into their movements. And this is exactly where the actors train too. It's not just seeing the lines. I'm sure you've all been to plays where you kind of feel like the actors are just running through their lines, as opposed to actually living those lines and being in them. So dancers have all the same training and all the same concerns, except we use our words. So we have to let all of that meaning come out of their bodies. And for, um, for people with Parkinson's, that has a very strong resonance, because remember, go back to that statement about the disease of subtraction. Parkinson's takes away what I would call the more theatrical elements that we all carry with us, our ability to express and gesticulate with our arms and our, our upper body. Um, we do that less here than, than perhaps in Italy or Greece, but you've all seen people who use their bodies to talk. Facial masking or limited expression is another symptom of Parkinson's. And so people often feel that they're trapped in a face that doesn't express how they're feeling inside. Very, very frustrating. Third, many people lose their ability to project their voice and sometimes to enunciate their voice. So that final means of expression, uh, vocal expression and vocal enunciation also becomes limited. So people start to feel kind of trapped in their own bodies without the means to express something. And dancers, of course, spend their whole lives learning how to express, sometimes through their voices, of course, but more through their bodies, through their faces. How do we tell a story to our bodies? And so to come into a dance class where we work on that, where it's a safe setting to explore that, is a, is a huge uh, step forward for folks with PD. Uh, this is a big one, those of you who are musicians, but everything that dancers do is guided by and initiated by the music. Even a choreographer like Nurse Cunningham, who uses music in, in somewhat random ways, not necessarily as a rhythmic undercurrent, in that company, when it existed, those dancers all had their own internal rhythms. They actually used to sing songs that they knew to keep, them, <laughs> keep themselves in line because the Actual music wasn't helping at all. Um, but music is a guide, and in, in a dance experience, it's not just a rhythmic guide. It's also something that tells you the tone of the movement, the emotional tone. It often triggers memory. So people do movement to music that they remember has a different significance, a deeper significance for music they've never heard before. And for folks who, as Dr. Hinchcliffe said, come in moving slowly, once the music starts, they're actually able to move in a unified uh, sense of duration again. That's, a, that's very significant. This guy up here on the, on the left, Peter, is lifting Jean. And yeah, it looks just like a hoist, you know? He just grabs her and pushes her up. But actually, in their minds, they're thinking about creating the effect of a bird in flight. This is from a dance of Mark Morris, it's called L'Allegro. And in this section of the dance, it's all about flight. It's all about flying. So if that were simply a mechanical goal, the audience would see a bench press. But what they see is a bird taking off. And that power that dancers have to use their imagination to create a certain aesthetic effect 
is in, in evidence in the, in the dance repeated class as well. Where often people have difficulty focusing on mechanical goals, putting one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, but when they focus on an aesthetic goal and get a sense of the reward for managing to achieve it, there's a little burst of dopamine, we think. And they have a satisfaction of doing something that feels good and looks beautiful. Even if it doesn't look beautiful, if they're not looking at the mirror, it feels beautiful. Dance is very rarely a solitary activity. We dance in groups, we dance together. I was talking to Oli, the visionary who came to, that, came to us with this idea a few weeks ago. I said, what, what is it that happens in dance class that doesn't happen elsewhere? She said, you know what it is? People look at each other. People look at each other in dance class. If you're, if you're spinning or you're doing an aerobics class, you're looking to the front and you're trying to make sure you're doing all the steps. In a dance class, as you can see in a couple of these pictures, we often do our class in a circle. So people are interacting across the circle. They're looking at people to the left and the right, like this gentleman here in a class in London. They're connecting. And not only are they connecting, but they feel connected. They feel part of a community. And they feel valued as part of that community, doing something meaningful together. Finally, getting into cognition a bit more. Dancers have to sequence a long chain or series of movements together. This is exactly the roadmap that people with Parkinson's start to lose. How do I get from point A to point B to point C? Because executive function is one of those things that gets affected in Parkinson's. The ability to make decisions about where to go, how to move, how to move on a template, whether that's through your house or through your day. And so to be able to work, at least in a, in a small form, in remembering movement, learning movement, remembering it, and processing it is very important for folks with Parkinson's. And one of the things that happens in this class is that we're always learning new sequences. Yes, we repeat things week to week, but every week I always try to bring in at least one or two new dances, new choreography. So people have to learn new movement sentences. And when you learn new movement, new movement sentences, your brain starts to build new brain cells. You also learn skills that you can use elsewhere. I had a gentleman um, told me, who told me in, uh, in Berkeley, California, he'd been taking a class for about three months. He said, you know, David, I got stuck at the grocery store a couple of weeks ago. I felt my feet starting to glue themselves to the floor. I started to panic. And then I started to think of choreography. I thought, if I can dance my way from here to the checkout counter, I'm going to have a much easier time than if I just try to think of walking. And so he choreographed, he had a plan in his mind, it wasn't very fancy choreography, but it engaged a little bit of a waltz, and he had music in his head. And because he planned it out and choreographed it, he was able to get going and avoid that, that feeling of being frozen. And so these skills are of course wonderful in the dance class, we all get to dance together, but they carry over into people's lives outside of the dance class. And we do we structure the class in a way that incorporates all of these elements in as seamless a way we can. So we use technique training, working on specific vocabulary from specific techniques, whether it's ballet or tap or jazz. Um, we have people in our class improvise. Neurologists said people with Parkinson's can't make up their own movement. They have trouble just moving around on their own. So well, actually, when you structure an improvisation and you put music on, and you put them across from someone and ask them to mirror, they absolutely can, and they do it beautifully. So we have uh, improvisation in a lot of our, our work. Narrative, the idea of storytelling, whether it's Swan Lake or West Side Story, um, we tell stories, we enact scenes, we allow people to role play in the class, to be someone else, to imagine what it's like to be in someone else's shoes and to act and to play that part. Uh, we also, throughout the class, figure out ways to connect, whether it's through holding hands, whether it's through partner dancing, whether it's through line and circle dancing, square dances, Virginia reels. All of these are ways that we get moving with our imagination creatively, but also connect with other human beings in the class. And of course, so much of dance and dance history is about making and reinscribing those social connections. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the slide, but really what we're trying to do is transition people's thinking from the patient mind into the dancer mind, 
how can we get people in our class to think like dancers and to think about movement creatively, imaginatively, musically, strategically? What we see over time, sometimes it's a period of a few weeks, more often it takes a few months, even a few years, is this idea of transformation. I'm no longer just a patient, I'm a dancer. I'm a dance student. I'm a performer. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And this, this sense of transformation creates a great sense of empowerment. Again, one of the things that people with Parkinson's contend with is this idea that things are being taken away from them. One of those things is the ability to control their movements, but also to control all aspects of their life. They don't know necessarily that if they leave the house in the morning, they're going to be able to make it back uh, uh, smoothly or, or in a way that they can actually initiate movement to get back in the car and drive home. They're constantly afraid of being stuck somewhere. And so to empower people, to give people the confidence that they have a set of skills, that they can use music, that they have choreographic strategies, is, uh, is deeply empowering. So I want to go back to this chart here and say, well, these things are, are very important, but why not have it all? <laughs> why not have all the things that, that dance training and the experience in the dance class can bring to your life? I'm not going to go through all these things, but a couple of them touch on what Dr. Will said. One is confidence, self-esteem, uh, relationships with partners. Our class is open to people with Parkinson's and their care partners, their spouses, their friends, and their families. They're all part of this dancing community, and because of that, the relationship among those family members starts to change. Because outside of the studio, people have a very specific sense of, of challenge and sometimes frustration. Those of you who are, who are care partners uh, know that. It's not always easy. Uh, but in a dance class, even though they may be assisting uh, their partner or their spouse, they're assisting as a dance partner. And that changes the dynamic entirely. One other thing I'm going to mention here is adherence. So people with Parkinson's are encouraged now to be as active as they can. Do something you love and stay with it. So the stay with it part is particularly key. And when you start looking at some of the forced intensive exercise uh, programs, they're great and the research is great, but it's really hard to get people to stay with it. Um, dance, for a number of reasons that you just saw, brings people back again and again. Our adherence rate is over 90%. So that means over 90% of people come to that class once, come back again and again and again and again over a period of years. We have some people in our group who have been with us for almost 10 years. Um, and the people who stop coming, stop coming because it's most likely because they're either no longer with us or because they just can't get to the class. It's not because the class itself uh, was, was out of their reach. It's just transportation is a, is a big problem. So adherence is a huge thing. And to be able to do something that you love week in, week out means that you're going to stay with it much longer than something that someone tells you to do because it's good for you and it's really, really not fun at all. Um, so we, we see now that dance is actually part of this, this pie. Um, and again, Parkinson's is very much a team, requires a team approach, not just from a pharmacological intervention, surgical intervention, physical therapy, but also dance, exercise, tai chi, meditation, massage. I want you to look a, a little bit at impact Check my time here. A little bit of impact, um, not only from the research angle, but ways that the program impacts people outside of the studio. So we have done a number of preliminary research studies, either at our dance center or at other centers around the world, um, programs that are based on what we do. And um, the first set of studies looked at motor skills, improvement of motor skills. This is based on the UPDRS, which is the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. It's a series of tests a neurologist would do in a doctor's office to, uh, to check someone's progress. And um, we see some significant improvements in several of the UPDRS uh, scales here, particularly relating to rigidity, hand movements, um, facial expression, uh, a little less on some others, but again, it was a, a small group. Arising from a chair, something that seems totally um, uh, insignificant, but for folks trying to get around through their lives, that's a, that's a significant change. So this is, this is one, one set of studies that we've seen, and they've all been uh, quite uh, encouraging about what dance can do. The second set I would call put into the mixed methods model. And this uses some of the, the motor measurements, but also quality of life measurements. How does this class affect people's quality of life, how they 
They want to about their daily activities, their relationships with their partners or their spouses. Um, this particular study was done in the University of Wilhampton, saw a significant improvement in short-term mobility as a result of the class, uh, reduction in social uh, isolation, and um, an improvement in, uh, in, in posture as well. So, um, and some of this work was actually done through video analysis, uh, recording the 12 weeks of the dance class and actually going through each individual in each class and seeing their, their physical changes over time. How do they uh, access the material and how do they then uh, uh, execute the, the dances more effectively or more powerfully over time? We've seen impact in less um, evidence-based ways, but in ways that are, that are equally significant in my book, and that is dancers effect as a catalyst. So we've seen this in a lot of communities where the dance class starts first, and then kind of spiraling out from that dance class, ancillary activities, singing class, a movement lab that focuses on specific symptoms but in a dance way, a theater group, um, uh, art, uh, art, uh, interactions. We have a, a group in Brooklyn that uh, goes to the Museum of Modern Art once a week where they, they walk through the galleries and then do some art making that responds to what they saw. So um, dance has a way of bringing people together but also inspiring them to do other things and that is key as Dr. Will said earlier that is key to maintaining um, uh, health, wellness, and managing your disease as well as you can. So another way we measure impact is simply where the program has started. And we know that where the program has started has filled a niche uh, or a void that was present, which is there was nothing creative for people with Parkinson's to do. And this is the, the map of the program from 2008, and this is today. We've seen a vast expansion. The thing I want to emphasize is not so much, oh, we look what we did, but really the idea that it is international and that dance, because it's sort of a universal language, it is able to cross over borders and boundaries. The program, uh, just to give you an example, the program in India doesn't use the same movement vocabulary we do, but they use exactly the same approach. So while we might use ballet and modern to, and tap to do our warm up, they'll use traditional katak dancing, which is a, a form of classical Indian dance. And then instead of doing uh, West Side Story or another um, Broadway homage across the floor, they will do Bollywood. So again, the ideas are the same, but the, the movement itself and the music is culturally specific. Another impact that we've seen is the way that organizations change because of this program. And this is significant, I think, as we're here, many of you here probably work with or in four organizations, institutions. Uh, for many dance organizations, this program has expanded their sense of what they can do. Um, what, who they can reach in their communities. Traditionally, dance education was geared towards, towards young people, people under 18. How do, we get, how do we get kids interested in this art form? And we're still very interested in that, but there's a whole generation of people who are adults over 40 who've never danced before. And traditionally, that segment was seen as audience members. I'm so glad to hear the women from, uh, from this, uh, from Milano uh, Twain talk about uh, the idea of actually people playing music um, at whatever level, because it's that sense of engagement that's, that's critical to reaching out to, to older adults. They don't just want to come see a show, they want to be in the show. They want to be in the class. And so for many of these institutions, uh, particularly advanced institutions, reaching out to the Parkinson's community has opened their doors and opened their way of thinking about how they can really be a community resource for people of all ages and for people who are aging and for those living with, with chronic conditions. It's also brought together collaborations between arts organizations and medical organizations, which traditionally have not had a lot to do with each other. And as we start to see the growing field of arts and medicine, we're starting to see those collaborations. In fact, sometimes the medical organization takes on some of the characteristics of the dance organization. This is the brand new Sorry, it was the best picture I could find. This is the brand new uh, neuroscience building at Stanford University, one of the West Coast's strongest and uh, most revered uh, medical science programs, both in terms of treatment and research. And what do they have inside this neuroscience building? 
they have a dance studio because the woman who runs the movement disorder center is a former ballerina who went back to medical school and believes in the power of dance and the power of arts as a critical part of patient care and management. So there will be a dance studio inside this institute. Now we were curious in our own group about how people used the activities, the creative activities in the class outside, on the streets, in their homes, in their daily lives. So we knew from, from some of the research that we've done, the evaluation that we've done, that more than 70% of people say their class improves their motor skills. We knew that. But does that happen just in the studio, or does it happen outside of the studio? Second question here, do you perform at least one activity of daily living as a result of the class? And 66% said yes, we do. There's one activity that I feel more confident in doing, I have more skills to do as a result of this class. Again, this was not at all Amy's objective at the beginning. She wanted, yeah, it was a little bit. She wanted strategies so that people became better dancers. But we started to see that, that flow over into people's daily lives. Number three, I integrate, we asked one of these questions, what elements of class do you think about outside the studio? This is one, I integrate music and rhythm more in my everyday life because of the class. That's um, about 71%. We know that Parkinson's is predominantly uh, an, an outpatient illness. People spend quite limited time in hospital, we hope not at all, but sometimes people experience falls or disorientation or need to have medication adjusted, and they will be in a hospital for a short time and often rehab if they've fallen. Um, but most of most people with Parkinson's spend the majority of their uh, of their lives outside of the hospital on their own. So they need a variety of skills that they can uh, conjure up when they need them um, in real life situations. And we realized that also we couldn't offer dance class seven days a week. We just don't have a budget for it. Um, we do have a video series that we offer, but we wanted something that was a bit more, we say, practical. And so I'm going to tell you the, for briefly the next chapter here is a collaboration that we're involved in right now. Uh, with a company called Google, some of you may have heard of Google, and uh, a creative agency in New York called SSMK. This is a program that uses Google Glass, which you can see this gentleman here wearing. Google Glass is a pair of glasses that have a little screen that sticks out. Many of you are, have read about Google Glass in the news because there's been a lot of press about it. People use Google Glass for things like watching their colleagues at work. You can take a video without anyone knowing. And so there's been some negative publicity about it because companies didn't like that very much. Um, there's also been some issues with the, the basic program, the way the glass is set up. Um, it, was a, it was a beta phase. It was never meant to be a huge commercial product yet. However, it did get out there and was piloted as part of an explorer program, as Google called it. But what they started to discover was that glass, Google Glass, has some very interesting applications in medical uh, use and in hazardous material use, and in what we call special applications, Google at work. So even though the, the consumer product has been pulled back while they redevelop it, the medical side of things and the, the sort of more practical work application or hazardous material application is still very much going forward. And fortunately, we are, we are part of that wave. So we, uh, we understood that there was a lot of work on what's called wearables, technology that people with Parkinson's could wear that would help them and their neurologist track the course of their experience during the day. So for example, you can have an app on your phone that tests tremor, because most phones have an accelerometer. You can test how, how someone's tremor is, is going at, at the certain point of the day. You can have people self-report when they take medication. So you can track that tremor to a medication schedule. Uh, you can ask people to tap the screen at a certain uh, a certain rate, and that mimics one of the tests of the UP, UPDRS, which is a finger tapping exercise. So you can actually measure how quickly someone is able to move at that time. And that's all great. I think there's a, uh, for people who see their neurologists four times a year, to have that kind of daily data going back to your doctor is a, is a fantastic leap forward. Um, but there was really nothing out there that acted as a toolkit or a set of strategies. And we thought, well, we have a set of strategies that dancers use. Let's see if we can have a program or an app that uses dance uh, 
to help with your projects and move better. So we apply for a grant from Google, and we got it. So we have five out of 1,300 applications, and we started going to work. And what, what works is that this is actually, in spite of some of its limitations, an amazing technology, because you can wear it. You can do it hands-free. You can activate it with your voice. If you have a walker or a cane, you don't have to hold anything in your hands. And so we started to see some uh, incredible possibilities here. It's pretty friendly. You can speak to it. It listens to you and understands what you're saying. Um, it's portable and private. You can carry it with you, and nobody knows what you're looking at. That's one of the things that made people a little un uh, uneasy at work. And uh, it, it will, you can choose to, to, um, to forward it or to, uh, to interface with it through verbal or tactile cues. So this just gives you a sense of what glass looks like when you're looking through it. You see the world, you can put lenses in if you want, but then in one small corner you see, voila, a dancer. You have four sections, they're based on things that we know people use from the class, uh, a, a little warm up, all based on Mark Morris rep. So this is not an exercise video, this is actually a creative arts experience. People are learning new choreography, new choreography and, and dancing to the actual music that we use in, in Mark's work. Um, a section that helps people get a sense of their balance, again, using dance activities. The bottom two here are a little bit more practical. One is called Unfreeze Me. When people start to feel that they're getting stuck, they can say, okay, glass, unfreeze me. And a video starts that helps them copy or imitate a dancer who's shifting his or her weight to the music so they can start to, to imitate. That's one of the things we learn from class is that people need external cues to start moving again. And so this program really gives them uh, those cues in a portable format. And finally, walk with me, which is the same principle, just allows people to follow a, a dancer who is walking at a certain pace. So here's the main menu, OK Glass, and then you have your menu of choices here. And again, this is all, all in, your, in your vision. And you choose one of those, and voila, it starts to count down. Can we actually, this is one of the videos that needs to be pushed. There's a little folks backstage, there's a little uh, start tab. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Just to show you, we'll, we'll fast forward in a moment, but just to show you what this looks like. So, uh, that's actually just a demo track. The, the, the final film is a lot crisper than that, but that was just our te to test the technology. Um, we also did a track uh, called Walk With Me, which again, for folks with Parkinson's, to be able to follow someone in front of them and actually see um, a pattern, a rhythmic pattern, is really useful. So for this one, this one <laughs> also has a, a video. Thank you. So after about 15 seconds, that one fades out because we didn't want anyone walking into traffic. Um, and they just hear the soundtrack. Again, using the power of music and the imagination to move in a portable tool. Oh. You know Joy from the film. There she is wearing the Google Glass. Um, another way that we've really uh, measured the impact or really pushed the program is towards performance. And this is in some ways, what we see is the last frontier. We never imagine that people with Parkinson's would want to be on stage performing for everybody. That's actually not correct. People with Parkinson's have the same dreams and desires that we all do, which is to be on stage and perform under the lights. And um, so this, this idea actually came from our group. We went to see a, a performance of the Mark Morris Dance Group, and one gentleman came back and said, I want to do that piece. I said, OK. We do that piece. He said, I want to do it and I want to perform it. Okay. So that was 2008. It took us a few years. 2012, we put together uh, a performance project and did two pieces, two excerpts of Mark Myers' repertoire. And we had two other choreographers come in and, and work on our group. And it was, for many people, a, a 
incredible transformation from a state of, I would say, pretty heightened anxiety and apprehension about what it was like to perform into, as Joel says, a state of bliss. As soon as the curtain came, came down, people said, maybe we get to do that again. That was the most fun we've ever had. They loved it, and it was a lot of hard work. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to provide for our students the next level of dance training, because there's a lot that happens in the class, but we wanted to give people the sense of what it's like to think like a dancer through and through and actually practice the same material for a long time to master it so that you can share it with other people. The sense of connection that they had not only with each other, but with the audience was, was dramatic and only served to reinforce those elements of confidence, self-esteem, um, satisfaction, and reward that are so critical for, for all of us. So just to sum things up, and I have another little uh, sort of send you off film that I think you're going to enjoy. It's very short. It's about three minutes. Um, but just to sum up, in dance class, the rules change. The rules for how you operate as somebody living with a chronic disease change. You can do anything in this class, particularly as it uh, affects the body, particularly as it, it impacts your creative imagination. There are very few limits. The experience is non-medicalized. We don't talk about symptoms. We don't focus on symptoms. We talk about the art form itself. And through the art form, people address certain things that are going on, but it's not at all symptom-based. We're not trying to fix a problem. We're not trying to address a problem, right? People often come into a therapy session and thought that I want to work on this. Something's wrong. Something's going wrong. I'm not happy with this. And there is, of course, a role for, a place for that. But the dance class is a place where we focus on possible and we don't focus on those specific problems, but rather teach a broad range of strategies and enjoyable activities that people really benefit from. We include people of all abilities and levels of mobility in the class. And again, even people who have quite minimal mobility are able to do the entire class because our teachers are trained to help them uh, adapt and translate material to all levels. And everyone contributes. This is a community activity because Parkinson's is a community challenge. A few things happen. Patients become dancers. Dancers become more engaged as community members. They start to understand what it is they actually have to offer their communities. And institutions think differently about how they serve their communities and how they deepen their mission. I always end with this photo. It's the curtain call from a Dance for PD group in Oakland, California, taking their bows. And for me, it represents the hope and the power of what the arts offer for people with Parkinson's and all of us who are aging, so everyone in this room, think, unless you know something I don't know. Um, sense of pride, a sense of connection, a sense of joy, and a sense of creativity. And being able to carry all of these things in the presence of some fairly significant challenges is to me the essence of inspiration and the essence of possibility. When the medicine is working, I can almost do everything. It's just that the amounts of time are it's shorter and shorter when it functions. Parkinson's forces you to reveal your vulnerabilities. You know, otherwise people mostly try to put on their best face, their best appearance. You know, I'm going out in public, I have to put on this and that, and I have to put my overcoat button it up tight. Well, you can't, if you're going with Parkinson's and you can't button it, you're, you're revealed, you know, there's no way about it. What happens to me 
When my feet feel like glue and they're stuck on the floor, I sometimes cannot walk, but I can dance. If I, I can, um, I don't know, I can give you an example. Should I start? Yeah. Well, for example, right now I'm, I'm walking. You can see my hand is shaking and I have the tremor. And if I try to walk, I have a great deal of difficulty. Um, I can walk a little bit, but if I pretend I'm dancing, I can do it. And I don't have any problems. The music leads. In other words, it's not my brain telling me to take a step or to do this or do that. The music is leading me. So I'm like following this wonderful leader who's so mysterious and has such a lovely sound and it's going to take me to some other place. What is that other place? Um, well, excuse me. It's a place where um, you're weightless, you know, you just, your body is just, um, just flies. It doesn't tug at you, <laughs> tug you and pull you and push you and, um, you know, have you. And these knots where you can't move and you can't think and you're struggling and fighting and just, you know, you, you, you go above that. Thank you. Let's film a film, a new documentary called Capturing Grace by Dave Iverson, the same journalist who made that first segment from PBS that you saw. When he made that segment, segment he fell in love with the program and said, I'm going to make a film. And that's a little clip from the film that's just being released now. So I want to thank you for being such uh, a welcoming uh, audience and for, for being so patient. I know there's a lot of information. Um, I think we're moving on, but I'm, I'm around all day, so please feel free to ask questions. Are we taking questions now? What's the, what's the plan? Yeah. Come, come talk to me. I'll be around. I'll be leaving one of the sessions in the afternoon. So thank you very much.